And when we read the Bible to find out what God requires, what we're looking for is a pattern. More specifically, we're looking for the blueprint of the church. This book is called Searching for the Patterns, My Journey in Interpreting the Bible. And uh, great, great read as well here. Uh, I think this could benefit a lot of people. So let's just start off uh, maybe in the beginning to give people an idea, a uh, foundation. Uh, what is hermeneutics? Hermeneutics is basically the art of interpretation. Hermeneutics is a way of discerning what someone's trying to say, you know, and we do this all the time. When you read a newspaper article, you're trying to figure out what are they trying to say? What are they telling me? When you're listening to me or listening to you, where people are trying to interpret what we're saying in the context in which we're saying it. So hermeneutics is interpretation. And when we read any text, whether a newspaper or a novel or a history book or the Bible, we are always already interpreting because we are trying to understand what the point is, what the meaning is. Uh, we're trying to discern something here that, that we can incorporate into our lives or bring meaning to our lives or help us understand our lives. And that's, that's kind of what hermeneutics is. That, that's, process of interpretation mm -hmm. and you mentioned that you uh you kind of transition you move from a blueprint hermeneutic to more of a theological one can you let us know maybe what caused that shift and maybe explain you know what what is the difference between these two sure i grew up in churches of christ i was deeply embedded deeply socialized i had a wonderful experience childhood and growing up in churches of christ i had loving family I had a loving church loving communities um, and i have the highest respect for my the, the way my life uh, was formed by all those people in my life so I'm very grateful for that. But the way I learned to read the Bible in that community was, and the way I advocated reading the Bible in that community, was we read the Bible to find out what God requires. And when we read the Bible to find out what God requires, what we're looking for is a pattern. More specifically, we're looking for the blueprint of the church. What exactly God wanted the church to be, how God wanted the church to worship, how God wanted the church, what the God wanted the church to do, how to get into the church, right? So we were looking for the patterns, and we imagined a, that, the, that the Bible, if we read it well, especially the New Testament, but especially the Acts and the Epistles, if we read it well, we would discover the pattern. And so we would take pieces out of the New Testament or out of the Acts and the Epistles, and we would take a piece and put it over here. Then we'd it'd be like a puzzle. And we're, we're finding all these pieces in order to put together a puzzle. The puzzle didn't actually exist in the Bible. It wasn't already put together for us. We had to read it in order to put it together. And so what we came up with historically is a blueprint that the church was supposed to comply with. And every true church would comply with this blueprint. Now, the problem was nobody could fully agree. I wouldn't want to say nobody, but uh, yeah. generally speaking, it was difficult to come to agreement on what the blueprint was. And, and this, this blueprint kind of idea is not something the Churches of Christ invented. It's, it's part of evangelical theology in a lot of ways. It goes back to Ulrich Zwingli in the 16th century and John Calvin and the Puritans and the Presbyterians and the Reformed Baptists. So we are not the only ones to think in these terms. But when we search for the pattern in that way, we all come up with different stuff. We come up with different blueprints.
because the blueprint is not explicitly there. You don't, for example, find what we in Churches of Christ call the five acts of worship. Five acts of worship are you sing and you pray and you give and you take the Lord's Supper and you have teaching from the Word. Now, those five acts are in the New Testament, but they're not listed as five. We have to pick them out and put them together in the puzzle to be part of the blueprint. And then we have to decide, okay, which parts of the New Testament are, are eternal? That is, which ones are, are what the church always is required to do in distinction from which parts are kind of temporary and cultural and situated and not everybody's supposed to do that. I mean, not every church is supposed to have women wearing veils, right? Not every church has to have a holy kiss in their assembly. Uh, you know, things like that. Uh, or 1 Timothy 5, the church is supposed to not support widows who are under 60. I don't think we do that one anymore. So the process here is discernment. How do I figure out what is a part of the pattern? How do I know whether it's temporary or essential? How do I know uh, whether this is going to uh, is a generic, a general kind of command that has a lot of different specific ways of carrying it out? Or how do I know this is a specific command that has to be done in exactly this way and in no other way? So that's kind of the blueprint mentality to, to read the Bible, to discover the blueprint. And I think it has it falls under its own weight, in my in my opinion. Yeah, because it just creates so many diverse understandings. And how I would what I would suggest is that that way of reading the Bible is a modern way of reading the Bible. It was something we invented. We, we invented reading the Bible that way, that when you look in the Bible itself, Paul doesn't read the Hebrew Bible that way. Paul reads the Hebrew Bible and Jesus reads the Hebrew Bible through the lens of what God is doing. Yeah. So this is the move from kind of a blueprint to a theological hermeneutic. By theological, I mean theos, theo, God, right? That it's a focused on, okay, what sort of people ought we to become? We should become the people of God. What does that mean? It means we are a people who are holy like God is holy. We are a people who imitate God. We are a people who are perfect as the Father in heaven is perfect. We are a people who are kind because God is kind. And we are a people who follow Jesus, God at work in Jesus. And so we do with Jesus. We follow Jesus, right? We become disciples of Jesus. And we do that by the power of the Holy Spirit. So we're looking at what God is doing. So the pattern is not some propositions that we reassemble in like a puzzle and then get out a list of things to do. The pattern is the activity of God in creating and redeeming the world in Jesus Christ. So essentially the pattern is Jesus right? and God at work through and in Jesus. So that's what I mean by a theological reading to illustrate you know, Second Corinthians 8 and 9, Paul wants the church at Corinth to recommit to this giving to the saints in Jerusalem. And he doesn't re ask them to recommit by virtue of a commandment. He doesn't. In fact, he says, I'm not going to command you. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to give you a rule here. Instead, what he does is he gives them a story. He says, if you understood the grace of God. You understand that God has graced you so that you can grace others. And then they can grace God. That is, they can give thanks to God. It is this dynamic of grace that ought to move us to be generous. Not a rule that we have to be generous, but the story forms us into generous people. And if we really believe this story, that the one who was rich became poor, for our sake, so that we who are poor might become rich. If we believe that story, then we will be generous people. And we will share our resources with others who have need so that there might, so that my abundance might supply their need, as Paul says. Mm -hmm. So, and Paul describes that 
as obedience in chapter 9, verse 13. He says, now, you do this. You live in verse 14, 13, 14. You live this out, and the, and people will give thanks to God, having received grace from you because you have received grace from God. And when you do that, it will be a witness to your obedience to the confession of the gospel of Christ. Obedience. Hmm. But Paul didn't give a rule. There's no rule. You know. But Paul still calls it obedience. Now, how can it be obedience without a rule? Because the obedience is not obeying a proposition, a rule in the text. Obedience is being conformed to the story of Jesus Christ, to become like Jesus, to be conformed to the gospel, to live worthy of the gospel, so that the gospel forms us and we become peop the people of God who image God and reflect the glory of God in our own lives. And so that's kind of a, that's what I'm calling a kind of a, and I'm not the one to invent this language, theological hermeneutic, because it's focused on what God is doing and how we imitate what God is doing. It's not focused on, oh, what did the church do? No, okay, let's imitate the church. You know, even Paul said, imitate me as I imitate Christ. Right? It's God's doing that we imitate. And we have a lot of good examples of people imitating God. And sure, we can follow that because they're imitating God. So it's not imitating the church because the church had a blueprint that they were following. It's rather we imitate God. And the church has a way of imitating God that we can learn from. But the, but the root of it is to imitate God. And that's our pattern is what God is doing. Yeah, that's that's beautiful. That's uh, that's how that's how the Lord works. Mm. Yeah. Well, you have a, a three step hermeneutical process toward the end of the book to kind of help believers uh, discern what the text is saying, and mm. uh, you know to participate in the mission mission of God, and um, maybe walk us through those uh, three brief steps that you have laid out. Sure. Uh, and this is just very general. Yeah. Uh, and I think people maybe can see they already do some of this. Uh, so it's a matter of just kind of, OK, let's think about what we're doing. Sometimes we just read and we don't think about, OK, how are we reading? What are we, what are we doing when we're reading? How do we generate discernment? How do we how do we discern what's going on? So I, I talk about the first thing, of course, is to, to be exposed to the text, to read the text. Try to understand what the meaning of the text is. This is kind of exegesis. What is the meaning of the text? What is the author doing here? What's the intent of the author? What is the function of the text? What's it doing? What does it call, like 2 Corinthians, what does it call the Corinthians to do? Right? What are they, uh, how are they to respond to this text? How would they understand this text? So that's kind of exegesis, like what we typically think about in studying the Bible trying to figure out, okay, what is Paul telling the Corinthians to do? The second step is more this theological move. It's about discernment. All right, so if that's what Paul is telling the Corinthians to do, why is Paul telling them to do that? What is Paul's rationale for his invitation to the Corinthians to share a resource with the Jerusalem saints? Why does Paul want them to do that? What is it that is uh, the theological basis of that meaning that Paul is sharing with the Corinthians. How is it rooted in who God is? What do we learn about God from this text? What do we learn about the gospel from this text? Is this consistent with the story of God? Is this how Israel lived out this story? Uh, Paul uses the manna, for example, in 2 Corinthians 8 and 9 to illustrate, okay, yeah, this is what God's intent is. He doesn't want anybody to have too much and others to have too little. He doesn't want everybody, he doesn't want people to have a lot of abundance, and then there are people who have needs. Um, no, the manna illustrates what God's intent is. So we're looking for the why here. What is the theology that is operative? What's the gospel in this text? Can you tell me the gospel in this text? What is God doing that uh, is the basis for what Paul wants the Corinthians to do? 
So Paul tells the Corinthians, I want you to share your resource. I want you to be generous people. Here's why. Because God is generous and God is grace to you. Now, how then do I share that with people today? And that's the third step. I don't just go to, to step one and reproduce it. Rather, I take the theology. I take the mystery of Christ. I take the meaning of the gospel. And I say, and we ought to be generous as well. Why? Because of the gospel. Right? Not necessarily because of what Paul told the Corinthians to do, yeah. but because of the gospel. Paul, Paul grounds his call, his invitation to the Corinthians to participate in this missionary fund for, or this benevolent fund, I should say, for the church in Jerusalem. And he tells them the reason for that is the gospel. What we want to do then is to understand the gospel. Like Paul says in Ephesians chapter three, I'm writing this so that you might understand my understanding of the gospel. So when you understand the gospel, then you can live out of the gospel. It's not that you're going to reproduce my books or reproduce my propositions or reproduce my actions even. But rather, you're going to learn the gospel, know the gospel, and the gospel is going to be part of your experience and part of your life, rooted in what God has done in Christ by the Spirit, and you will live worthy of that gospel. So that third step is, okay, how does the gospel, what does the gospel look like in action in my life and in my church? How can we be a gospel church, a church that lives worthy of the gospel? It's not about per se, are we, are we living up to a blueprint? Are we doing everything the early church did? No. Are we living worthy of the gospel? That becomes the real question. Uh, and discerning that is the hermeneutical process. And that's why I call it a three-step. We go from the text to the theology, and then we go from the theology to life. And everybody mm -hmm. who reads the Bible does that. Mm -hmm. they, they're just not necessarily self-conscious about it. Or they think that they're no, they're going from step one to step three. No, because everybody still makes decisions about veils, right? Or head coverings for women or holy kisses or widows who are over 60 or under 60. We, we all still make decisions, a process of discernment. It's what do we ground the discernment in? Do we discern, do we ground the discernment in a blueprint? The expectations of a blueprint? that we then reproduce in the 21st century? Or do we ground discernment in the pattern of God's activity in Christ by the Spirit? Do we, dis do we ground discernment in the gospel? And I think that's the key point myself. What are some ways that you think uh, or you see where, you know, modern Christians were maybe not understanding who the author is writing to the particular situation that those that group of individuals might be facing, their culture. And it seems like a lot of times we come up with an interpretation the way we view it through our lens that maybe the author did not intend for that to be the interpretation. I've heard that called uh, mm -hmm. different terms, coffee cup Christianity, where you uh, just kind of lift a verse out of context and you, you stick right. it on a coffee cup or, you know, a refrigerator, mm -hmm. a magnet or something. So what, what are some of the um, scriptures that you see that maybe, uh, maybe we're missing a little bit on that uh, because we don't really right. have an understanding of what those people were dealing with and who the author was writing to? Oh, that's a good question. It's about, it's about reading in context, isn't it? It's about hearing these words in the context in which they were spoken, to whom they were spoken, why they were spoken, what's the situation they were spoken in, instead of treating the Bible like a jigsaw puzzle. Uh, I mean, one, here's a classic example that I think most people have heard, or at least it's a very common one. You know, Jesus said, uh, uh, go and do likewise. Well, whatever you, you could pick that out, and, and then you can make people do anything, right? Judas hung himself, go and do likewise, right? Now, you know, that's how, that's what can happen when we treat the Bible like a jigsaw puzzle, where we take propositions and then we put them together and we make something new out of it, which is not a part of the context itself, right? 
So, for example, in 1 Corinthians 9 and in 2 Corinthians 10, 11, Paul is refusing to be paid by the Corinthians, right? Mm -hmm. um, and some would suggest, well, you know, see, we don't need to pay preachers or something like that. You know, we don't have to share because Paul didn't take it. You must be greedy because you're taking money. Paul didn't. Well, that's that doesn't understand what's going on in Corinth. Because in Corinth, when they thought they could give Paul money, they thought they could control Paul. They thought that was patronage. And patronage means, okay, I'm going to hire you as a teacher, but you got you to gotta do what I say. Right? I'm still your boss. And Paul didn't want that relationship because he thought that would hurt the gospel. I mean, that's, that's just one example of, of the sort of thing that uh, we do or you know, you could take the veil question. Oh, women, when they pray and prophesy, they need, to, they need to have a head covering on. Well, that's what the text says. But there was something going on in the context of Corinth that required that. Because we don't see that in 1 Timothy 2, where they got braided hair, which apparently means they're not covering it. So in 1 Timothy 2, they're not covering it. And in 1 Corinthians 11, they are covering it. I mean, what's going on with that? There's different situations. Or... Paul says in 1 Corinthians 7, hey, it's better not to marry. But then he says in 1 Timothy 5, uh, you younger widows, y'all get married. And we could say, well, Paul just contradicting himself. Well, no, he's writing to the Corinthians because of their situation. And he's writing to the widows in Ephesus because of their situation. And their situations meant different applications. Uh, not a contradiction, but a different situation called for different advice or different counsel about how to how to live in that situation. So, yeah, I mean, we could just multiply example after example that when we lift a verse out of its context, we give it a new context. A proposition only has meaning, only has authorial meaning in the context in which it is written. And when we lift that proposition out and we put it on a billboard or something, then it has a new context. It's, and it's a context we bring to it. And when I bring the context to a proposition, I can make it say anything I want it to say. And that's what we do with the Bible sometimes. That's that kind of coffee cup, superficial reading. It's reading the propositions without understanding the context and without understanding what's going on in this text. It's, it's a way of reading the Bible irreverently, it seems to me, because mm -hmm. we're not taking seriously the idea that these books addressed situations and were written in a context, and they were written within a narrative or a letter that provides a fuller context. And when we just lift verses out, out, out of them, in order to prove a point or to create a new agenda or to create a new meaning, then we're not treating the Bible with respect any more than if you took one of my books or one of yours and we took a line out of one of our books and we put it on a billboard and they say, well, that's what John Mark Hicks meant. Well, that, no, my, my, my sentence has a context to it and you can't just lift it out and make it say something that was never a part of what I was intending to do or, or intending to say. Yeah, I, I've heard it said that like the letters, many of the Paul Pauline letters written to the churches that today, if, if someone, if I sent you a letter, you're going to read the entire letter. Hmm. You're not yeah. going to take uh, one sentence out of that letter and highlight it and maybe make a, a doctrine out of it or a statement out of it, it all has to flow in context with with, with what the letter is saying uh, to you to get the the full yeah. uh, full meaning. I think that's exactly right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, any any closing comments you want to leave with the leaders here? Well, when we read the Bible, I think we have to remember that the Bible was written to its original audiences. It was written in their language, in their culture, in their situation, 
It wasn't written in English. It wasn't written to me. It wasn't written in my, to my situation. So we had to remember, and this is showing proper respect for the Bible, that it was written to them, but it was written for us as well. It was written for the whole church. Paul says about the law of Moses in 1 Corinthians 9, that it was written to them, but for us. In other words, we can draw meaning from it and, and draw help from it and draw guidance from it. It can teach us righteousness and it can reprove and rebuke us, right? First Timothy or Second Timothy 3, 16, 17. But we have to treat it respectfully in the sense that recognizing it was written to them. And what we want to draw from it is exactly what Paul told us he wanted us to hear. He wanted us to understand the mystery of Christ. That's why Paul writes so that we will understand the mystery of Christ. So the goal in reading the Bible is to understand the story of God, understand the mystery of Christ, who is at work in our lives by the power of the Spirit. And that's the story we want to understand. And that's the story we want to live out of.